We put him, <laughs> put him in here in West Virginia. I told him that was our beach. <laughs> Brother Harold Tab, will you come preach here? There's somebody's car. I wonder if that's mine. <laughs> God bless you, Doctor. Bless your heart, Doctor. Right Amen. Sure. Amen. Amen. Well, it's good to be in West Virginia again. It's been about six or seven years since I've been up in this neck of the woods. Uh, turn to Psalm 85 just a moment. This is not the message. This might be a good motto verse for, for the week. Psalm 85. Boy, the Lord's good, isn't he? Amen. Psalm 85, verse 6. Wilt thou not revive us again? Amen. And what for? that thy people may rejoice in thee. Uh, it's our prayer the Lord will bring revival this week uh, to this church. And may I say the responsibility of that lies on each individual. If you're going to have revival in the church, it's got to be in your heart as an individual. If you would, go with me to 3 John. That's where we'll take our message from this morning. 3 John. Now in 3 John, there's uh, three men listed, and they're all members of the same church. And uh, we're just going to break it down and look at it for just a few minutes. First of all, we see a man named Gaius. He uh, represents the truth that was practiced. Verse 1 says, The elder unto the well-beloved Gaius, whom I love in the truth. Beloved, I wish above all things that thou mayest prosper and be in health, even as thy soul prospereth. For I rejoice greatly. When the brethren came and testified of the truth that is in thee, even as thou walkest in truth, I have no greater joy than to hear that my children walk in truth. Beloved, thou doest faithfully whatsoever thou doest to the brethren and to strangers, which have borne witness of thy charity before the church, whom if thou bring forward on their journey after a godly sort, thou shalt do well, because that for his name's sake they went forth taking nothing of the Gentiles." We therefore ought to receive such that we might be fellow helpers to the truth. Now, the second man is uh, Diotrephes, and he's, uh, he represents the tongue that was poisoned. Verse 9, I wrote unto the church, but Diotrephes, who loveth to have the preeminence among them, receiveth us not. Wherefore, if I come, I will remember his deeds which he doeth, prating against us with malicious words, and not content therewith, neither doth he himself receive the brethren, and forbiddeth them that would, and casteth them out of the church. Beloved, follow not that which is evil, but that which is good. He that doeth good is of God, but he that doeth evil hath not seen God. The third man is Demetrius. He's the testimony that was pleasing. Verse 12, Demetrius hath, hath good report of all men and of the truth itself. Yea, and we also bear record, and ye know that our record is true. May I say that all three of these men are in most churches? All three of them. There are people in, in the churches that... Uh, uh, that uh, live by the truth, they practice the truth, they believe the Word of God, they apply it in their own lives, their own hearts, and live like God wants them to. And then there are people who, like uh, Diotrephes in verse 9, they do nothing but gossip and dig up dirt and find uh, fault with everything that's going on. And then uh, Demetrius, just a quiet church member in the background, doing what he's supposed to be doing, having a good testimony from everybody around. They're in every church just about that you can think of. Father, we thank you, Lord God, for your goodness, your mercy, your blessing, your grace. Thank you, God, for this week that's been set aside for the preaching of the Word of God and for a revival meeting in this church. And, Lord, we pray, God, that it won't be just a, a weak meeting, but, Lord, it'll be something that'll be lasting in this house of God, that the people be revived and drawn close unto Thee, resisting the devil, causing him to flee from this place. Uh, God, minister every service. We just pray Your will be done. Uh, among every member here this week, in Jesus' name, amen. amen. Now, I want us just to take a little exam starting this, uh, this revival meeting and ask ourselves a question. Each person, ask yourself this question. If every member was just like me, what kind of church would this church be? Amen. amen. Yeah. If every member was just like me, what kind of church would this church be? 
Now, let me just say this uh, in starting because I don't know, I don't really know you. Uh, I'm sure everybody here claims to be saved, but uh, you're not going to have any kind of church at all unless everybody's saved. So uh, everybody needs to know the Lord Jesus Christ as their own personal Savior. Everybody needs to come to the point where they realize they're a sinner and on their way to hell and realize that only Jesus Christ and His shed blood can save them from that hell and repent of their sin and receive Him by faith as their Lord and Savior and be saved and become a part of the family of God. So a church needs every member to be saved. Now, churches have uh, names on roles that are not saved a lot of times, but you need to make sure you belong to the Lord Jesus Christ. All right, let's ask some questions. And just take this little quiz this morning. Number one, if every, if every member came like me, what kind of church would this church be? Right. Hebrews chapter 10 verse 25 says, Not forsaking the assembling of yeah. ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another so much the more as you see the day approaching. That verse tells me that I need to be all the more faithful to the house Amen. of God as I see the coming of the Lord uh, approaching, as it's coming nearer and nearer. Be more and more faithful to the house of God. The Bible commands faithfulness to the house of God. It commands faithfulness to the house of God. 1 Corinthians 4 verse 2, it's required that a man be found faithful. And may I say faithfulness to God begins with faithfulness to the house of God. If you're not faithful to church, you're not faithful to God. And that's the bottom line. We've had a man visiting our church off and on for the last three or four months. He doesn't, he's not a member of any church. He doesn't want to be a member of any church. I call, I call those characters maverick Christians. They're out there roaming around all by themselves and and I think they're right with God. And he, because he's a part of the body of Christ, he's in the real church, he says. Uh, no, you've got to be a member of a local Bible-believing church or God's not even interested in whatever you want to do for him. It come, all, all ministry comes all right, through the local church. Let me say, if uh, every member came like me, what kind of church would this church be? Would the services even start on time? Uh, I've got a half dozen people in my church come dragging in halfway through the song service every Sunday morning. Man, it just it just uh, it just disrupts everything. Yeah. They come in late and yeah. and uh, sometimes skip Sunday school. Would there even be a need for Sunday school if everybody came like I do? Would it, would there be a need for this revival meeting this week if everybody was going to attend the services like I'm going to attend them? Amen. We need to be faithful to the house of God. Would we have to stop the Sunday night services? There are churches all over this country now that do not have a Sunday night service. They don't have a midweek service. What's that all about? It's about people not being faithful to the house of God. You quit coming on Sunday nights. Guess what? The preacher has to say, okay, there's no point in paying the light bill on Sunday nights. Nobody's here. Amen. Right, Amen. Amen. If they come like I do, what kind of church would we have? Question number two. If every church member had a testimony like me, what kind of church would this church be? Uh, Galatians chapter 1 verse 10, Paul says, Do I now persuade uh, God or men? If I yet please men, I not be the servant of Christ. We're not here to please people. We're here to please the Lord Jesus Christ. We come here for Him. We come here to worship the King of kings and the Lord of lords. We're not here to play games. We're not here to see who's here and who's not and what's going on in everybody's life and find out the latest gossip. We're here to serve the Lord, to worship Him. Amen. Hebrews 11 verse 5 says uh, Enoch had this testimony that he pleased God. Yeah, right. Boy, what a testimony. If you got that testimony, you got all the testimony you need. Yeah, that's right. Amen. That he pleased God. Let me say first of all, it must be a clean testimony. Your testimony is all you have out there in front of that world. That's right. Out that's in the right. workplace, the marketplace, your testimony. If you don't have a testimony, you don't have anything that's out there. Right. We are God's emissaries. We are His ambassadors, 2 Corinthians 5 says. We're the ones supposed to be drawing people into the kingdom of God. And uh, they're not going to be drawn in if we don't have a good testimony out there. You can't have a good testimony today and a rotten one tomorrow and expect that guy to listen to you when you talk to him about Jesus. Amen. It's not going to happen. What kind of testimony? It's got to be a clean one. 2 Corinthians 3 verse 2, Paul says, We are epistles known and read of all men. 
an epistle. That's just a letter. He says we're a letter. We walk around and people read us. What are they reading when they read you? Are they reading a godly person? Are they reading a Christian? Are they reading somebody faithful to God that loves God? Or are they reading somebody that just does what he pleases uh, regardless of what the Word of God has to say about it? What kind of testimony do you have? It's got to be a clean testimony. Let me say also, it's got to be a clear-cut testimony. No straddling the fence. No wishy-washy about your testimony. No middle-of-the-road Christianity. God is so concerned about that <clears throat> that in Revelation chapter 3, He said, I would you'd be either hot or cold yeah. rather than lukewarm. Yeah. Why in the world would he say that? To be hot is to be on fire for God, to be zealous for the Lord. To be cold is to be so backslidden you don't have anything to do with God. Why would he want that, those two extremes, instead of at least just be lukewarm? Because if you're hot or if you're cold, everybody knows where you stand. If you're middle of the road, nobody knows where you are stand. You live for God on Sunday and live for the devil on Monday, nobody knows where you are. God wants a clear cut testimony in our lives. Joshua had one. Joshua 24, 15, he said, hey, you folks do what you want to do, but as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Definite decision to live for God. 1 Kings 18, verse 20, 21, Elijah's in a conflict with the priest of Baal, and he says, how long halt ye between two opinions? If the Lord be God, follow him, but if Baal, then follow him. You know what he's saying? Hey, if the Lord is your God, follow him. If the devil's your God, then follow him. Have a clear-cut d- direction you're going in so everybody know where you stand. Just like the Sunday school uh, preacher teacher was uh, teaching this morning. Uh, don't be in the middle of the road. Let people know where you are. Be hot or cold for the Lord. Amen. No middle of the road. If, 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 if you want to follow some false God as he was talking about, go right ahead. At least people know where you are where you stand. It also must be a consistent testimony. We ought to be the same all the time. The Bible says Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Hebrews 13 verse 8. We're to be like Him. Amen. Follow our Master and walk in His steps as 1 Peter 2 uh, tells us to do. A a, uh, consistent testimony. That's what Paul's talking about when he says be instant, in season, out of season. Don't matter if you're sick or well, still stay right with God. Doesn't matter if the sun's shining or it's storming, stay right with God. Amen. Be consistent yeah. in your testimony. Yeah. Let, when, when bad things happen in your life, let the world see that you're still trusting in yeah. the Lord. Yeah. And it's got to be a convicting testimony if it's any good. That's right. Our testimony ought to be such when we walk in the room, they'll quit their cussing. That's right. They'll That's quit right. telling their dirty jokes. Yeah. Yeah. They'll know somebody that loves God is in their presence. Yeah. And they'll, they'll just shut it down, whatever they're doing, a convicting testimony. Matthew 5, 16, Jesus said, Let your light so shine before men that Amen. they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. Amen. They ought to be able to tell uh, that, you're, that you love the Lord and you're right with the Lord. Whether they want to believe in Him or not, they ought to know that you do. Amen. A convicting testimony. That's what Paul and Silas had. They got beaten within an inch of their life. They got locked in the inner prison, the Bible says. At midnight, the Lord uh, brought that earthquake and opened the doors and all that business. And you know what the jailer did? The guy that was in charge of having them beaten, the guy that was in charge of locking the door and putting those those, uh, religious nuts in the jail and all that stuff, you know what he did? He comes running in and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? Why? He had witnessed their testimony and it convicted them. He had seen them go through that tribulation, that trial, staying right with God. It convicted him of his sin. Amen. 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 If everybody had a testimony like me, what kind of church would this church be? Number three, every, if every church member contributed like me, what kind of church would this church be? Would you look back at Malachi chapter 3? I know you're familiar with it, but look anyway. Going backwards, Matthew, Malachi chapter 3. Verse 8. Will a man rob God? Now stop and think. That sounds ridiculous. Somebody going to put on a mask and take a forty-five and put it in God's face and say, stick them up? Will a man rob God? Yet ye have robbed me. But you say, wherein have we robbed thee in tithes and offerings? You're cursed with a curse, 
Double curse for stealing from God. For ye have robbed me, even this whole nation. Bring ye all the tithes into the storehouse, that there may be meat in mine house. And prove me now herewith, saith the Lord of hosts, if I will not open you the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing, that there shall not be room uh, enough to receive it. And I will rebuke the devourer for your sakes, and he shall not destroy the fruits of your ground. And on and on God talks about how he's going to bless if they give what is rightfully his. The Bible says the tithe is the Lord's. Right. It's not mine, it's not yours, it belongs to God. And so uh, if everybody contributed like me, what kind of church would we have? Look back, uh, two books, Malachi, Zechariah, Haggai chapter 1, a few pages back. Verse 6, ye have sown much and bring in little. Ye eat, but ye have not enough. Ye drink but ye are not filled with drink. Ye clothe you, but there's none warm. And he that earneth wages, earneth wages to put them into a bag with holes. You know what the problem is there? You read it in the chapter, in the context, they were forsaking the house of God. They were just letting it fall apart. They were not taking care of God's business. And so God said, okay, if that's the way you're going to be about what I have, I'm going to be that way toward what you have. And uh, no matter how much money you earn, you're not going to have enough to eat. You're not going to have enough to wear. It's just, no, it's just going to be a bad time for you because you're stealing from God. I'd rather steal from my grandma than from God. Amen. I'm not going to take nothing that belongs to God if I can uh, help it be aware of it. Amen. Proverbs 3, verses 9 and 10, he says, Honor the Lord with the first fruits of all thine increase, so shall thy barns be filled with plenty. God promises a blessing if we just take care of his house. That's right. And he promises a curse if we don't. We read that in Malachi chapter, chapter 3. So if everybody gave like me, I mean, what kind of church <laughs> would, would be able to even turn on the lights at, uh, for the evening yeah. service if everybody gave like I do? I mean, hey, you, you don't pay the power company, you ain't going to have any lights. That's right. But it takes money to do that. God has set it up that way to operate His business on money. It has to be the right portion. He said, bring the tithes and the offering. You realize a millionaire's tithe is no more than yours? That's right. Yeah. That's right. Why? It's 10%. That's right. For everybody. That's the definition of tithe. 10% for everybody. And so it's the same for all people. God made it that way to be fair with everybody. It has to come to the right place. He said, Malachi, the storehouse. Well, that's the temple in the Old Testament. That's the local church in the New Testament. Amen. Your tithe does not belong to the radio preacher. Amen. It does not belong to the, to the uh, uh, children's ministry. It belongs to the local church. Yeah. And the local church distributes it out to take care of missionaries or whatever, whatever uh, uh, the, that particular church is doing for the Lord. So it has to be in the right place, has to be for the right purpose. There are people who will come to church regularly. They'll enjoy the padded pews, the air conditioning. Do you use air conditioning up here? Well, we have to run it all the time where I'm at, <laughs> even in the wintertime. Uh, the lights, they enjoy everything and don't contribute one red cent toward the operate. It costs to operate a church just like it costs to operate your home. And uh, they'll sit there and usually those who don't give or don't give what they should, they're the loudest complainers. They gripe the most about what's going on. And they're not putting anything into it themselves. If every member gave like I do, what kind of church would we have? Mm. I call those the freeloaders, the Christian bums, the hobos. <laughs> they just get on the train and don't pay. Amen. Amen. Number four. If every church member cared for souls like I do, like me, what kind of church would this church be? Acts 1 verse 8 says, uh, God says, after the Holy Ghost has come upon you, you shall be, he didn't say you shall speak in tongues. He said you'll be witnesses unto me. That's what, when you're filled with the Spirit of God, you want to tell other people about the Lord Jesus. You want to be a witness for him. He said after the Holy Ghost has come upon you. Well, he came upon you already if you're saved. Came upon you when you got saved. Amen. And he said, you're supposed to be witnesses unto him, unto the Lord Jesus Christ. So when's the last time you warned a sinner? Amen. Told them where they're headed. Ezekiel 3, verses 17 and 18, he says, Son of man, I made thee a watchman. 
We have a, we have a duty. We, we have responsibility to be watching for other people's spirituality, whether they're saved or lost. He says, therefore, hear the word at my mouth and give them warning from me. When you're giving the gospel, you're talking to somebody about the Lord, you're giving them warning from God himself. He says, when I say unto the wicked, thou shalt surely die, and thou givest him not warning, nor speakest to warn the wicked from his wicked way to save his life, the same wicked man shall die in his iniquity, but his blood will I require at thine hand. Makes me wonder how many of us are going to stand before the Lord at the judgment seat of Christ and have somebody's blood dripping off our hands that the Lord is required because we did not warn them. When you warn somebody about the Lord, guess what you're doing? You're getting their blood off your hands. Yeah, right. Amen. Amen. You'll be doing what you're supposed to be doing. When's the last time you warned a sinner? When's the last time you wept for a sinner? Yeah. Psalm 126, verses 5 and 6. They that sow in tears shall reap in joy. He that goeth forth with weeping, bearing precious seed, shall doubtless come again with rejoicing, bringing his sheaves with him. His fruit, that's what he's talking about. He said, you go forth with weeping, bearing precious seed. The Lord said in the Gospels, this is the seed right here, the Word of God. He said, you'll doubtless come again, bringing your sheaves with you. Not everybody we witness to is going to get saved. We understand that. But uh, you fish enough, you're going to catch something. Is that not true? Amen. If there's no fish in this hole, go to that one. When's the last time you wept for a sinner? Sometimes the Lord doesn't move in our testifying for Him or our witness for Him because our heart's not in it. Our heart's just not in it. And when is the last time you won a sinner? What is this? September 2014. Won anybody to Jesus this year? We're in the ninth month already. When's the last time you won a sinner to the Lord? Proverbs eleven thirty. He that wins souls is wise. Yeah. Amen. What's the opposite of wise in the book of Proverbs? Fool. fool. Yeah. Then if I don't win souls, I must be a fool. Yeah. In that context, right. he that wins souls is wise. Yeah. Uh, we're to we're to give. You say, well, uh, I can't uh, I can't save anybody. You're right about that. Paul said, he said, I have planted. Apollos watered, but God gave the increase. So all of us can plant a seed. All of us can water a seed that's been planted. And then it's up to God whether that person gets saved or not. It's up to that person whether they turn to the Lord or not, repent of their sin. But our job is just to carry it out there and give forth the gospel. So if every church cared for souls like I do, what kind of church would we have? Number five, if every church member complained like me, what kind of church would this church be? Do you realize complaining is contagious? It really is. One person starts it, others pick it up. A preacher, I'm glad I'm not like Moses. He had 600,000 complainers in his church. <laughs> wow. So, so much so that every once in a while he asks God just to kill them, get rid of all of them. <laughs> Amen. Complaining is a sin. Acts 19, verse 32, uh, they're, they're in the um, uh, theater there in Ephesus, and they're against Paul and the Christians there and trying to get rid of and all that. And it says, Some therefore cried one thing and some another, for the assembly was confused, and the more part knew not wherefore they were come together. That's the way it is when, with complaining. When it gets contagious and other people pick it up, half the time they don't even know what it's about. They don't even know what started it. But they get in on it anyway, and eventually you have a church split because of that kind of stuff. All right, All right preacher. Yeah. Knew not that we're confused. Some people complain about the preacher and his message. I know you never do that here, right, preacher? They never do that here. Yeah. Well, he preaches too long. He preaches too short. He's too loud. He's too soft, you know, and just on and on. Uh, he's too negative, and, and he's too positive, and on and on they'll go sometimes about the preacher and his, uh, his message, and sometimes about the preacher and his methods. I don't like the way he does this, and I don't like the way he does that. You realize if you leave church here today, any day, and uh, on the way home you say, I can't believe what the preacher said. Can you believe that? You know what you're doing? You're brainwashing your kids that are in the car with you that's right. against the man of God and against the church of God. That's right. And that's why we got kids growing up in our churches today. They get 18, 19, leave the church, and they never come back. Amen. And it's been, been put in there by their parents complaining about this and that along Amen. the way. Amen. Complaining, boy, that's bad stuff. <laughs> Philippians 2.14, Paul said, Do all things without complaining and disputing. Yeah. All things. Amen. 
Some complain about the people and their mistakes. Always looking for, you know, he's got everybody under their microscope and they're looking for who did what and who said what and all that stuff. We just need to forget about junk like that. Amen. He said in Ecclesiastes chapter 7, he said, basically, I'm paraphrasing, but he said, basically, don't even bother listening. Don't take note when somebody's gossiping about you. Why? Because you've gossiped about people. Yeah. So he's just reaping what you sowed. Yeah, that's right. Don't even bother worrying about it. Don't pay it. I can't believe what they said. Never mind what they said. You probably deserved it anyway, right? We deserve hell, right? Complaining about everything. Amen. Amen. First Peter 4 verse 8. Above all things have fervent charity among yourselves. For charity shall cover the multitude of sins. You really love each other. You're going to look, overlook a lot of stuff. A lot of things. Second Corinthians 10 verse 12 says basically we're fools if we compare ourselves among ourselves. I'm a better Christian than they are. I, I'm faithful to church. They're not. Be careful about that kind of stuff. Uh, Galatians 5.15, he says, if you bite and devour, you'll be consumed. Yeah. Right. Amen. You'll destroy yourself. <clears throat> I remember years ago when our kids were growing up, and you probably thought they were still growing up. I know I look like I'm 39, but <laughs> I passed that eons ago. But when my kids were growing up, I, I kept animals around for, to give them something to do. Amen. And uh, at one time, we had 60-something critters on our property. <laughs> but we had some chickens. And I noticed uh, something about chickens that's a lot like Christians. When a chicken gets hurt, a sore, a scratch, a cut, the other chickens will peck that place. And they'll continue doing that till eventually they just kill that chicken. They'll peck it to death. That's where a lot of Christians are. They'll see something out of order in somebody's Amen. life and they'll peck on that thing and peck on that thing and peck on it as if it's any of their business to start with and, and ultimately destroy a child of God. Amen. If we'd just Amen. leave things like that alone, if we'd edify, if we'd build up, if we'd be a blessing, ye which are spiritual, restore such a one in the Amen. spirit of meekness, Galatians 6, 1 yes. says. If we'd have that attitude, it might help God to be able to get that person back in line with himself yeah. instead of us browbeating them and beating them down and beating them down until finally they just throw in a towel and quit. If everybody complained like me, what kind of church would this church be? Number six, are you taking the quiz? If every church member covered his sins like me, what kind of church would this church be? Listen, if, if everybody knew me like I know myself, would they want to hear me sing? Would they want to hear me teach a Sunday school class? Would they want to hear me on, preach a message? Would they want to hear me testify about the Lord if they knew me as well as I know myself? Have I got something hid yeah. in the closet somewhere? Uh, Amen. Uh, Bible condemns secret sins in Psalm 90 verse, uh, verse 8 and secret faults in Psalm 19 verse 12. God uh, has a principle in this book called accountability. He doesn't use that word, but we're to be accountable for what we do. Just like that uh, Christian I said a few minutes ago, been visiting my church and doesn't want to join anything. You know why he doesn't want to? He doesn't have to be accountable to anybody. He doesn't have a preacher breathing down his neck when he's out of order with God. He doesn't have church members calling up and saying, where were you? We missed you this morning at church. Not accountable to anybody. God wants accountability in our lives and that keeps us out of that secret sin and out of those things that we don't want anybody else to know about. But God knows about it. And you know what? He has, a, he has a habit of taking the lid off of stuff. Numbers 32 verse 23, he says, be sure. That sounds like certainty to me. Be sure your sin will find you out. And personally, I believe God's doing that to His church in these last days because we hear of uh, wickedness going on in churches all over. I believe God's taking the lid off of, off of the, the uh, uh, infidelity in His bride and exposing all that stuff and so He can get it all cleaned up for the judgment seat of Christ so He can have a bride stand before Him without spot or wrinkle Amen. or any such thing. Yeah. Cover our sins up, but God sees them. Every time. James says, confess your faults one to another. Not your sins. You know, if you want to confess to the priest, go down to the Catholic Church. He didn't tell you to do that. You confess your sins to your Heavenly Father. But we all have faults. We all have idiosyncrasies. Idiosyncrasy, the root word is idiot. We all do things that makes us look like an idiot sometimes. Is, is that not true? So we're to confess our faults one to another. Don't live a double life, Christian. Don't be one thing before 
other Christians and something else before your workers on the job or whatever, or wherever else Amen. you're at. Don't, don't do things like that. Number, by the way, that'll cause people not to get saved. I've heard it over, over time. I've heard people say, well, you know, if that's a Christian, they're doing the same thing I'm doing. What's the difference? Yeah, that's right. Amen. Number seven, the last point of the quiz. If every church member came and responded like me, what kind of church would this church be? Respond to what? To the preaching of the Word of God, to the teaching of the Word of God. If they responded like I do, do you ever just uh, go to the altar and get things right with God? Yeah. Uh, get under conviction under some preaching or something like that and just sit there like a knot on a log and do nothing about it? Yeah. If everybody responded like me, what kind of church would we have? You'd have a cold, dead church. That's what yeah, you'd right. have Amen. if they never responded to yeah. the preaching of the Word of God. I mean, what do you do with the messages you hear? Yeah. Amen. Amen. Do you leave church and have Rose Preacher or do you leave church and talk about uh, the things he said and how we need to change this and we need to shape up that and so on and so forth? Uh, how do you look at the messages you hear from God? Uh, God does not put preachers up here to entertain. Amen. In fact, he says to the preacher in Isaiah, he says, lift up thy voice like a trumpet and cry aloud and show my people, right. not the world, my people, their sins. Amen. Uh, the job of a preacher is to reprove, rebuke, and exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. That's his job. So let him do his job, and then you act according to what he told you. Right. Amen. Amen. Why? He's watching for your soul, the Bible says. So what do you do with the messages that you hear? Are you like the man that stands at the door after the service and preacher's uh, shaking hands with everybody, and the man comes out and he says, Hey, preacher, uh, everything you said today applies to somebody I know. Yeah. What about applying it to you? Make it personal. Amen. James 1.22 says, Be doers of the word, not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. You deceive yourself just to listen to the word, not do anything with it. This, this book is alive. This book puts life in us. Amen. It, it uh, divides asunder soul and spirit. The joints of marrow is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. This book can read your mind. You read it here long enough, you're going to run into yourself and your condition before God. What do you do when the Word of God is given to you? How do you respond to it? Now let me close with a few thoughts here. Do you have a revived church here? Do you have a rejoicing church? I enjoyed the testimonies this morning. Some good testifying going on, brother. How about a reaching church? Well, all that depends on whether you are revived, whether you are rejoicing whether you are reaching forth. This is your church. You make it what it is. Right. Well, our church, I'm, I'm not satisfied with our church. Well, it's your fault. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. The church is the people. The church is made up. You got to be friendly. If you want a church filled with the Spirit of God, you got to be filled with the Spirit of God. If you want a church that's generous towards missionaries and works of God, you got to be generous in your giving. If you want a church that uh, brings people in to worship God and fellowship with the saints of God, you got to be bringing them in. They're not going to just walk off out of the street out there. That rarely happens in churches. Rarely happens. You want a church that's loyal to God and filled with the love of God, you got to have those things in your own heart. You see, it's you. As the old, old uh, spiritual says, not my brother nor my sister, but it's me, O oh Lord, standing in the need of prayer. Amen. It's me, amen. You need to be what you want your church to be. And if that's a joint effort with everybody, the church will become what you think it ought to be. Our Father, we thank you, Lord God, again for the privilege of being in the house of God this morning. And for this first uh, beginning of this revival week, God, I pray you'd bring revival to this house of God, revival to this uh, congregation. Uh, Lord.